And on that note, um, I'm just so very, very thrilled uh, to introduce uh, today's speakers. The, the paper, just before I go into it, um, I, would, I would like to acknowledge um, a couple different things. First of all, that Northwestern does reside on indigenous land and it is involved in histories of displacement. And I would like us to all explore our relationships with indigenous, uh, indigenous histories and our engagements today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the disproportionate, um, display, the disproportionate effect that administrative policies have had on um, people with young families, uh, working staff uh, during the COVID crisis. It is my great, great honor to introduce these two scholars um, that are going to be giving a talk today, or specifically one person, Alice Sampson, is going to be giving a talk, and Alice and Jago are going to be joining in on the conversation. But before I get too far, I would like to acknowledge that there are a series of different authors involved in this paper that's going to be presented. There is, of course, Alice Sampson and Jago Cooper, but also co-authors are Maria de las Mercedes Martinez, Victor Serrano, and Tony Nieves. And we are very happy to uh, have all of their intellectual input into this discussion. Um, so um, Al the, the, the Alice, who will be delivering most of today's discussion, is an archaeologist in training and has and long been interested in issues of seafaring islands and maritime communities initially in things like Bronze Age Europe, but more uh, for the past two decades in the Caribbean. Since 2013, Alice has co-directed a field project on Mona Island in Puerto Rico uh, in collaboration with students and colleagues from the British Museum, Puerto Rican Institute of Culture, and the Ministries of Culture and the Environment. There, they investigated and investigate questions around indigenous material and conceptual worlds, European, African, indigenous encounters, and colonial dynamics in the Caribbean. After holding fellowships, at the posi fellowships and positions at Cambridge, Cambridge's MacDonald Institute and Le Leiden University, she became a lecturer at University of Leicester. Um, her co-PI is Jago Cooper. Jago is also a very storied scholar. Up until very, very recently, he was the curator for the Americas at the British Museum and uh, has most recently joined uh, what I think, Jago, you just described as the most exciting and interesting museum that no one's ever heard of, which is unfortunate because it's really a cool position that brings together just so many different things. Um, and he's a professor of art and archaeology. Um, and this is just so recent, I always trip up on which university it is. If you can remind me the university, Jago, that would be great. University of East Anglia, equally of East distant, Anglia. but equally important. Excellent. Um, and uh, Jago is also very well known for having uh, been a television personality, introducing archaeology to the world, and then has also been one of the f few archaeologists out there that have really engaged in serious thought, kind of what transnational archaeologies look like, specifically around issues of the environment. M some of you might um, kn know his work with Christina Douglas, uh, comparing Caribbean and uh, South, South Indian Ocean environmental landscapes over long periods of time. Without any further ado, I'd like to hand the uh, the microphone over to them, and I look for, forward to hearing about effective economies in the early colonial Caribbean. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, and um, thank you uh, very much for the invitation to come and share some of our research here, um, and thank you to you all uh, for coming. Um, I'm going to do something very boring, and I'm going to basically read this paper, which is not something that I usually do, and I know it's hard to kind of hold attention when someone reads a paper at you, but I, this is because this paper is um, kind of a result of, you know, some thoughts that are coming together um, at the moment, and um, I'm going to make it a little bit lighter and easier on you by um, showing some uh, images in a PowerPoint presentation as well, um, and I'll start that uh, now. Um, 
Mark told me that the theme of this uh, series of, of talks this semester was resilience. And although um, uh, Diego and I um, work on um, issues of, of, of resilience, Diego particularly around climate um, in, in the Caribbean, I'm not going to be mentioning resilience explicitly, but I think that you'll be able to see that the theme of resilience is an undercurrent um, throughout uh, our work and in this paper. Um, so let me find the slides. Yeah. Um, can you all see the, the first slide? There it should be a title slide. Yeah, great. Okay, fantastic. All right. So the 1492 encounter in the Caribbean is notorious for leading to the extinction of local populations. This earliest of new world lies set the tone for subsequent settler colonial histories of Eurasia across the Americas. This is despite the presence of multiple indigenous communities in the Caribbean today, indigenous revitalization in the islands and diaspora, and a long tradition of Caribbean scholarship on the diversity of indigenous legacies in all aspects of life. On Trinidad, St. Vincent and Dominica, indigenous peoples have official recognition and territory. In Puerto Rico, indigeneity is part of the language of national and personal identity and mobilized around issues of sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And in the Dominican Republic, indigenous identity is racialized and asserted against the Africanness of Haitians next door in ongoing and violent relations. In other words, indigeneity is experienced, located and manifested differently on every island and, conno and connotes different things, all of which are quite distinct from indigeneity in other parts of the Americas. In this dynamic context, cultural heritage occupies an ambivalent position. Manifestations of essentialized and romanticized indigeneity, such as the statue of 16th century indigenous rebel leader Enriquillo outside the Museo del Hombre Dominicano in Santo Domingo, coexist with Indio as a term of disparagement in rural communities away from the Haitian border. In Puerto Rico, the, the three root model, African, European, and indigenous, of national identity is, widely, um, is widespread and promoted by the same cultural institutions reluctant to engage re with revitalization movements. And in most places, the study and display of indigenous things as antiquities, a term used by a Spanish priest on Hispaniola 500 years ago, persists in European, in, Euro in Euro-American anthropological museum practices. Across the Caribbean, indigeneity intersects with rural, urban, religious, Afro, Asian, Euro, and later immigrant identities. But everywhere, there is a separation between the academy and the community. That is between national and elitist discourses and communities and in individuals' everyday experiences of indigeneity, whether in the realms of cultural production, medicine, or grandmother's wisdom. The disconnect between official state narratives and the plural communities they represent is perhaps most emphatically seen in the realms of archaeology and museums, where indigenous is not now, but occupies a discrete place called the past. This is compounded by the fact that archaeology in the islands is often conducted by outsiders who present pre-Columbian histories disconnected from local political contexts. And this has been commented on in um, Caribbean archeolo archaeological literature, for example, by Jay Haviser, who um, calls archaeologists, many archaeologists, inquisitive tourists. This separation has, been, has made archaeology slow to the possibility of new narratives and collaborative practices. In this context, insisting we are working on but a small corner of the pre-Columbian past perpetuates the separation. So how do we address the context of coloniality in which archaeology takes place? Our project, with its origin in academic questions and directed by British and Puerto Rican researchers and institutions, is no exception to the situation outlined above. We are outsiders on multiple levels. By dint of working in um, privileged academic institutions, for example, in the case of um, several of us, and outside Puerto Rico. We take a standard approach to contrast the material findings from the archaeological record with colonial texts to come up with new insights into indigenous agency in the early colonial period. This is the intellectual backdrop against which we relate the findings of a field school by a team of academics, museum professionals and students on Mona Island, Puerto Rico, which was active until hurricanes and the pandemic put pause to our work. For the duration of our fieldwork, we found ourselves occupying the same location where coerced laborers had lived and worked 
in the first half of the 16th century, and later in differently grim conditions during the 19th century guano mining boom. The carceral nature of past people's experiences contrasting with our own voluntary labors. The hammocks in which we slept, as we later discovered, a material and effective connection to the hammocks manufactured in this spot. Everywhere we looked, we saw agency thwarted, or at least the emancipatory potential of post-colonial archeology span seemed unobtainable for our subjects through us. We required a different approach. Not alone, a willingness to embrace different perspectives as well as a commitment to change ourselves and our disciplines has been gathering a pace across the arts and sci sciences, including archeology. span Inspired by currents, especially in post-human feminist archaeology, feminist science, and their borrowings from indigenous theories of relations, we attend to the potential meanings of labor performed in our field sites. We not only aim to change the stories we tell of the past, but allow those inquiries to change our scientific subjectivities and the kinds of stories we will tell in the future. This paper is an initial reflection on early colonial industries as caring labor, rather than just commodity production, or a point along a spectrum of resistance. Archaeologists of the Spanish colonial period focus on particular categories of material culture, often in the earliest contexts of encounter where typological and local incomer separations are most easily defined, namely exotic materials in gift exchanges, such as metals, beads, and clothing. And this focus on the reception of foreign goods captures early aspects of colonial material dynamics. But these separations become increasingly harder to make in the post-contact period, marked by the end of gift exchange and the start of unequal and non-reciprocal power dynamics, as discussed so eloquently by Roberto Valcalcel. Emergent identities such as Indio, uh, Indio Maroon, self-emancipated slaves, and Creole appear. In particular, Roberto Valcalcel's work de-essentializes indigeneity and resists sub sub subalternizing narratives by showing how diverse colonial peoples adopted new forms of dress and mortuary behaviors, becoming Indio. In, in the main, traditional practices, have not attract, traditional practices have not attracted so much attention in archeology span as that which is from the new, as that which is new or from the outside. Partly this has to do with the persistence of acculturation thinking, which assumes change flows into receiving cultures. The identification of a 16th century cotton workshop on Mona Island gives us the opportunity to balance this. We investigate how traditional things such as hammocks and cassava bread quickly became part and parcel of free and unfree contexts, extending sensory environments and shaping conditions of interaction throughout the Spanish Caribbean. Consideration of traditional things and their re-territorialization or the way they are incorporated within new assemblages of people, things, and places helps us explore particular moments in the emergence of colonial worlds. The picture of the 16th and, century, 16th and 17th century Caribbean as a failed Spanish project quickly abandoned for greater riches in the rest of South America is a form of representation which, which creates historical absences, removing the Indian and African from the plot. To address the absences, we draw on recent work on assemblages in post-human archeology, span as well as readings of ethnographic theory partially borrowed from indigenous Amazonian ontologies and the Caribbean material record. In particular, we deal with the issue of absence through looking at the Spanish institution of indigenous slavery called encomienda as an assemblage. We propose that looking at colonial assemblages sidesteps some of the ways post-colonial archeology span can't get beyond agency. And I'm just gonna say a, a few words about this kind of theoretical background, which is inspired also by um, a group of archaeologists in Leicester, uh, Leicester University, such as Ollie Harris and Rachel Trellin, who are working with these ideas. So assemblages are gatherings of material and non-material things temporarily brought together in specifically and historically situated ways and existing at multi multiple temporal and spatial scales. As a tool, assemblage thinking is useful in archaeology because it examines multiplicities whose arrangements are to be fathomed rather than assumed. Assemblage thinking foregrounds relations and emergence. This means it can deal with some of the challenges in post-colonial archeology, span such as the constant return to the colonizer, colonized binary, even if muddling it a bit, because it eschews binaries and fixity. It does not trip on the loose ends of hybridity because entities are never bounded in the first place. And it does not necessitate pinpointing a particular subject on the resistance spectrum. 
because relations are dynamic and produce multiplicities. Challenging the human non human divide, post humanism allows other relations of importance and affect to emerge. Post human assemblage thinking can be an empathic tool to reframe colonial situations where some humans have been strongly categorized and associated with fixed capacities, such as the subaltern, because it allows new stories to emerge. We consider early colonial labor or the experience of encomienda as an assemblage. In a, in a paper comparing labor in the Spanish, I've got these, the day cool. Um, in a paper comparing labor in the Spanish colonial Americas, Corcoran Tad and Pesa Rossi describe the encomienda system in Guatemala as an assemblage of laborers, knowledges, pre existing political relations and infrastructures, and the ecological and geologic affordances of the region they inhabited. To this mix, we would add affect as an important force in assemblages. Spinozan theories define affect as forces which shape bodies or the power to affect and be affected. In a related but different definition of affect, meaning emotion, Sarah Ahmed's work on the affective economy discusses how affect adheres and moves through objects such as that they become sticky with emotion, creating attachments between things, bodies, places, and collectives. The encomienda system extracted strong affective materials such as gold and pearls, but it also created things enabling sleep, rest, and sustenance, such as hammocks and cassava bread. All these things have power to literally shape bodies. An alternative narrative of the encomienda system might refocus on these latter aspects of how diverse peoples and new technologies of rest and sustenance circulated, accumulated, and had political and material effects which defy extinction narratives. To do this, we also draw on feminist scholarship on caring labor, as well as anthropological literature on conviviality and well-being from indigenous South America, one of the ancestral homelands of indigenous Caribbean peoples. Indigenous communities in Spanish controlled estates were major producers and exporters of hammocks and cassava bread. Caribbean societies, in, including the mainland, Amazonia, and parts of Mesoamerica, have been producing textiles and processing cassava for millennia. Cassava is one of the earliest New World domesticates, present on mainland Caribbean coasts around 8,000 years ago, and the islands by at least 5,000 years ago. Working starchy tubers, um, particularly cassava, set the rhythms of everyday life in indigenous communities. Partly to remove toxins and also to make other staples such as cassava beer, Intensive preparation involved peeling, squeezing, and grating the tubers to make flour, which can be baked on flat ceramic riddles, commonly found in the Caribbean archeological record from around 2,500 years ago. The presence of griddles traditionally heralds the arrival of agriculturalists in the islands, although it is increasingly clear that so-called archaic peoples had sophisticated relationships with plants and probably introduced them much earlier. This includes cotton, and wild and domesticated varieties of cotton were also some of the earliest plants used in the Caribbean. I'm basing a lot of this on the work of Jaime Pegan um, Jimenez, um, who's a, a, a Puerto Rican archaeologist and um, archaeobotanist. Fishing nets, furnishings, and other daily material culture were made from plant fibers, including cotton. In the late pre-Columbian period, cotton was used for highly crafted and high status exchange valuables, such as beaded skirts and belts, and I put one of them on the slide here portable figurative sculpture, and hammocks. Hammocks were multivalent objects. From the Spanish and from archaeology, we learn that as well as beds, they were used in contexts of rest, work, transport, and death. Hammocks were used as furnishings inside houses, as well as on the move, in war, and agricultural work. There were differences between hammocks for daily use and larger, softer, more elaborate hammocks used to bear caciques, or the indigenous elite as well as funerary shrouds for the same. The many rock art images of figures with wrapped bodies across the islands have been interpreted as hammock shrouds, and the frequency of tightly flexed positions of many burials indicate that this practice. Hammocks were important exchange valuables and continue to be so in the 16th century when they and cassava bread were used as tribute payments. In the 16th century, the indigenous textile and culinary repertoire was transformed and reduced to a specialized industry of mass produced cotton bedding and bread for accommodating colonial populations. Hitherto unknown in the old world, cassava bread and hammocks were adopted and quickly mandated by the Spanish crown as the board and lodging of the Spanish colonies. 
It was the paternalistic duty of the Spaniards to care for the spiritual and physical well-being of their indios, and hammocks and cassava bread were distributed as part of the colonists' legal obligations. This happened within the encomienda system. Gosden observes, Chris Gosden, the archaeologist, observes that colonialism is crucially a relationship with the material culture, by which he was carving out a more explicit role for archaeology in understanding the reconfiguration of things, values, and power in colonial situations. Encomienda was at the sharp end of this reconfiguration. The encomienda system was a form of forced labor whereby the Spanish crown allotted up to 80 men, women, and children to an individual, an encomendero, of a certain status, usually a vecino, so uh, a, a high status free Spanish man, for two thirds of the year. First implemented by Spanish colonists in Hispaniola in 1503 and later in Puerto Rico from 1509, workers, often under indigenous leaders, were put to work in gold mines, pearl fisheries, agricultural fields, salt ponds, or domestic service. The Spanish crown implemented a sham reciprocity which involved compensating labor with religious instruction and redistribution of clothing and other items originally stolen from communities in the first place. Whether and how this was implemented was up to individual en encomenderos. This was the Spanish moral economy, legally and historically based upon classical texts and centuries of just war between Christian and non-Christian peoples in Europe, North Africa, and the East. Different forms of exploitation operated sim simultaneously under the encomienda system. And indios encomendados were taken from communities which were broken up, amalgamated, and relocated closer to Spanish interests. They often lived and worked alongside enslaved Africans um, and enslaved indigenous people from other islands. Hard labor and disease led to desertion, armed rebellion, and suicide. And between 10 to 30% of laborers survived to return to their villages at the end of a period of service. And again, Roberto Valcácel has written a lot about the encomienda system in the Spanish islands. On the ground, colonists, for the most part, were small-scale entrepreneurs, and their laborers of diverse island and mainland origins, some local and free, others outsiders and enslaved. For example, gold mining, one of the major extractive industries, commonly involved a group of, tw of 12 to 15 laborers and a Spanish overseer, equivalent to the crew of a canoe, who would congregate with other crews to extract gold from a riverbed, plain, or geological outcrop. And um, Khalil Suedbadillo has written a fantastic book on the Spanish gold mining industry in, in, in Puerto Rico. And a lot of this information comes from his work. What must have characterized many of these temporary work camps which sprung up all over the islands is the close proximity and degree of intimate cohabitation between laborers. Such camps might consist of hundreds of men, women, and children who were temporarily brought together, temporarily brought together for up to half a year. This proximity is one of the differences between encomienda as a model of economic exploitation and later plantations in which the plantocracy kept local indigenous communities and enslaved Africans at arm's length or literally out of sight. In this context, hammocks and cassava were used and consumed by insiders and outsiders alike to embed themselves into new environments, forming the basic infrastructure of labor camps in the Spanish colonies. Waves of colonists, mercenaries, farmers, and churchmen embarked upon an unstable and ununited series of projects to steal and extract as much gold and pearls as possible with the fungible bodies of Indians and later Africans. What strikes one from the correspondence in this period is the constant infighting, court cases, and disagreements between the church, crown, and uh, between the church, crown officials, and settlers. The scale of the illicit economy was enormous, and it is probably not an exaggeration to say the majority of transactions were unregulated by the Crown. Prices were manipulated, taxes evaded, goods smuggled, slaves illegally traded, and accounts fabricated. Indigenous and maroon resistance was constant, including decades of direct warfare. Armed resistance across Hispaniola and Puerto Rico, supported by indigenous alliances with islands to the east, and joined by rebel European settlers provoked Spanish reprisals called entradas y cabalgadas, and escalations of guerrilla warfare throughout the first half of the 16th century um, are reported on frequently, not to mention external threats such as attacks on Spanish ports and ships from English and French pirates, which increased from the 1520s and which exacerbated the fragmentation and fractious interaction between colonists. Armed rebellion, desertion, and non-cooperation by indigenous African and European individuals defined early colonial life. The defensive installations and fortified towns established throughout the first half of the 6th century in the islands testified to this climate of insecurity. 
European power was precarious and relations of power were heterogeneous. In this volatile and insecure context, hammocks and cassava were the first local traditions to be transformed into colonial industries. Their production was embedded in local ecologies and knowledge. At first, bread and hammocks were extracted by settlers from local communities as tribute payments, especially in areas where gold was scarce. But later, both staples were mandated by the crown as a necessity for all workers. Spanish crown estates, such as Toa and Mona, specialized in their production to sell to encomenderos to supply their crews. Our focus in this paper, then, is on the labor carried out by an indigenous collective in the Royal Encomienda of Mona Island in the early 16th century. Mona today is an uninhabited island in the Northern Caribbean with an early and dynamic pre-colonial history. Although certainly frequented by people for over 5,000 years, its archeological visibility increased dramatically from the 13th century when caves filled up with rock art, at least two ball courts drew people into the island's interior, and a village was established at Sardinera Beach on the west coast. Spotted by Columbus during the second voyage, it was over 10 years later that Mona was established as one of three crown-controlled supply stations, or granjerias. Descriptions of the island and crown estate are provided by Spanish chroniclers, de las Casas and Fernández de Oviedo. Both remark on the island's abundance of fish and crabs, the presence of fresh water, the agricultural fertility of the estate, and especially the great quantity of cassava, bed, cassava bread produced there. The Las Casas observes that the cassava was so large it was, struggle for a, it was a struggle for a single person to carry. Abundance and fecundity are tropes about the Americas from Columbus onwards, narratives which served a variety of political ideological purposes and portray as natural and effortless, something which was the product of indigenous knowledge, landscaped, landscape management and skilled husbandry. The Spanish crown estate of Mona was one of the earliest and most prolific exporters of hammocks and cassava bread in the 16th century. A community of indigenous workers produced between 75 and 85 tons of cassava bread from year, per year from 1513 into the 1520s under um, the estate overseer um, Francisco de, de Barrio Nuevo. Francisco de Barrio Nuevo ran the Mona estate under both the Columbus family and later under the Spanish crown and is described variously in the chronicles as a nasty piece of work or in Estanciero Vicioso, um, who was known for his kind of ill treatment of the Indios under his, under his charge. Cassava bread was shipped um, to the ports of Puerto Rico and San Germán from Mona, as well as from estates in Hispaniola, such as Igüe and Saona coinciding with the height of the inter-island indigenous slave trade between Hispaniola and Puerto Rico. After cassava bread, the second industry on Mona was hammock production. Although it is likely that cotton grew on Mona, as it does wild today, given the scale of production, raw cotton was probably imported from elsewhere. Spanish treasury and shipping documents indicate the export of at least 750 hammocks from Mona between 1516 and 1520. Spanish control of Mona loosens towards the middle of the century with the official end of encomienda. On the one hand, documents reveal Spanish anxiety about lack of defenses, absence of a priest and dens of pirates. On the other hand, material culture points to the increasing autonomy of a creolizing population, their participation in illicit trade and Mona's position as a magnet for maroons, deserters and other escapees of empire. The strictures the first half of the 16th century stand in contrast to the greater freedoms post encomienda most notably in terms of religious expression and in another part of our field project we've also published on the rock art the 16th century rock art in this period which shows a very different set of circumstances archaeological survey and excavation uh, allow allows us to trace the transformation of the indigenous site at sardinera into a spanish encomienda Previous research obtained 13th century radiocarbon dates from the settlement and mixed indigenous Iberian material, material characterizes the upper layers of the site and pinpoints Spanish arrival. In 2016, we conducted a shovel test survey um, covering the, the coastal area and running inland to the base of the cliffs, which identified areas of indigenous occupation across approximately three and a half hectares. Some of these areas consist solely of 16th century materials, indicating the activities of the Spanish estate were not confined to the pre-Hispanic settlement. Excavation in 2017 focused on a five by five meter unit in an area of low mounds and the highest concentrations of mixed European and indigenous material culture. 
the archaeological layer had no discernible stratigraphy, the bottom of which, um, 30 to 50 centimetres below surface, was a floor with discrete accumulations of pottery and flat-lying coral slabs. We excavated to a depth of over two metres without encountering another archaeological layer. The majority of material consisted of sparse indigenous domestic and food waste, with ceramics of the Chican Ostianoid subseries, both Capa and Boca Chica styles, typical of Puerto Rico and Hispaniola, respectively, and reflecting the island's position at the crossroads um, between these islands and likely indicating the origins of the Encomienda population. Suggestions of the presence of non-local indigenous laborers may be seen in the recovery of a bone bird pendant in a non-local style and a large oyster pearl. This pearl is likely from the waters off Venezuela where indigenous divers were subject to encomienda in Spanish run pearl fisheries. The connection between dispersed Spanish enterprises is un underscored in documents such as a letter from Francisco de Barrio Nuevo in 1519 asking the crown for permission to bring Lucayans or indigenous Bahamians resident in Hispaniola to pearl fisheries off the Venezuelan mainland. This pearl potentially ended up on Mona brought or smuggled by an indigenous enslaved person as part of the illicit economy. Diversity in encomienda populations is something seen in other locations, notably in Cuba at El Chorro de Maíta, where individuals of Mesoamerican origin and African descent have been identified sharing the same cemetery. Around 15 to 20% of the excavated assemblage is made, is made up of Iberian imports, including domestic storage and serving wares such as olive jar, Columbia plain, and other 16th century uh, types. No later material was recovered. Two of the Colombian plain shirts uh, on the bottom left of the slide have been modified in what appears to be indigenous style through the addition of rim notches and engraving. Conspicuous in the material assemblages, in the material assemblage, were at least eight spindle whorls made from local and imported pottery. And these are, are made for um, producing cotton thread. As well as this, we have, um, so here's an image of some more of those spindle whorl fragments. As well as this, we have two metal thimbles, 25 wrought iron nails and an iron hinge piece and other um, accoutrements as well. We interpret these finds as components of a thread production workshop and a possible storage facility. Material and archival evidence suggest the whole sequence of hammock production took place on Mona. This is based on documentary evidence with the import of ginning equipment for removing seeds from raw cotton, the export of finished hammocks together with archaeological evidence for spindle whorls and thimbles for spinning yarn. Other materials are also possibly associated with this, including a number of flat coral slabs, which may have been used as ginning stones, uh, and, um, and at least three fist-sized stones possibly used as weights. Disc-shaped spindle whorls, like those found on Mona, are commonly made from recycled pottery and found across indigenous sites. Of the eight spindle whorl fragments from the site, Three are made from recycled pieces of Iberian imported glazed pottery, and you can see those on the slide there. These choices reveal imported vessels underwent the same processes of reuse as local ceramics and incorporation into an existing repertoire. The presence of tools such as thimbles and ginning equipment reveals a demand for metal and other accoutrements to aid processing and thread manufacture. The nails potentially belong to a structure in which cotton and cotton products vulnerable to damp were kept dry. The excavated area did not define the boundaries of these activities, but nevertheless, seem, this seems to be a work area or a storage facility to keep equipment and cotton thread. The importance of the hammock in the early colonial period deserves closer attention. The hammock is a multivalent object, a portable home and more than bed technology. In contrast to colonist distaste for local foods, as has been revealed in uh, Kathleen Deegan's work in, 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 and, um, in La Isabella, Hammocks moved quickly from objects of curiosity to adoption as furnishings, field beds, and status symbols. Spaniards stole hammocks, redistributed them, adopted the elite practice of being born aloft in them, commissioned their manufacture for personal use, and introduced them on board ships. For incomers used to heavy woolens and blankets, cotton, and especially cotton beds, would have been a welcome innovation. Not only adopted by Europeans, Maroons probably adopted hammocks too, as inferred from settlement features or the lack of them in fugitive sites in Jamaica and Surinam. Such was the importance of the hammock to the functioning of the colonies that production spread to Europe, 
and in 1513, over 2,000 hammocks were sent from Spain to Hispaniola and, and Castilla del Oro in the mainland. When considered from the perspective of the effective economy, we can dig deeper into the significance of the hammock. The way affect flows through the encomienda in tunes us, attunes us to the world-making projects which were going on. Hammocks and cassava had exchange value as commodities, but they also had value and power within relational effective economies to outsiders and insiders. There's a gender aspect to this as well, as it was likely um, that the skill and knowledge, that it was the skill and knowledge of women which transformed tubers and raw cotton into hammocks and bread. Articulating with alienation within the colonial assemblages, their manufacture and circulation linked bodies of makers and users to each other, including those of Africans and Europeans. Hammocks and cassava socialized people into new environments, eased them into particular bodily dispositions and sensations, patterns of privacy and the intimacies of eating and rest, literally embedding them into new worlds. Hammocks and cassava bread and the ways they physically connected their makers to the bodies they nourished can be seen as a form of caring labor. The provision of physical comforts through the encomienda system in places like Mona was a way colonized peoples eased their and others suffering. Hammocks connected bodies to other bodies, known and unknown, settler and resettled and opened up relational worlds between those in similar predicaments. More than simply metaphors of spiritual and physical comfort, an ethos of caring labor may have been a response to colonialism, which we can see in the archeology. span We're not proposing that these were explicit and collective forms of resistance or solidarity, although they may have been in some instances. Rather, we support this with ideas in ethnographic theory, particularly on the anthropology of indigenous Amazonia. These focus on the moral economy of intimacy, the ideal of buen vivir, or the art of living well together, and the importance of conviviality, or the ability to be social, which entails practices centered on the body and on the sharing of substances to make kin. A lot of this is based on the work of uh, anthropologists Overing and Passes, uh, Peter Riviere, uh, Fernando Santos Granero, Aparecida Villasa, and um, uh, Vivieros de Castro. Making kin involves drawing others in. In Amazonia, this means turning people into familiars as opposed to animals or enemies, such as cannibals. This is not primarily achieved through institutional or genealogical structures such as marriage, but through relational flows of substances and objects close to the human body, such as food and things of nurture, namely cassava products, baby slings, and body ornaments. Santos Granero's work on native Amazonian materiality and personhood makes the point that making people is a process of construction and one which involves ongoing fabrication. According to Viasa, the bundles of affects and capacities which make up bodies require care because of their inherent instability and their propensity to transform unless appropriately fixed. Though we reject the idea of linear connection from Amazonia to the Caribbean, the archipelago was at various times through its history populated by Arawakan and Caravan speaking peoples, sharing related ideas about being, well being, and body ontologies with the indigenous Caribbean and suggested by material culture. The multi-perspectival qualities of art and everyday objects in the pre-colonial Caribbean show the transformability of people, things, and animals, as well as the reciprocal and dynamic relations between people, between humans and non-humans. Objects are commonly Janus-faced or display kinetic iconography, which transforms when held in particular ways. And we can see here on this Zemi object, or like three-pointed stone carving. I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but we can see that we have a face on um, the end uh, here, you see two uh, hollow eyes, but these are also the legs and the feet of another figure where the soles of the, of the heels are also the nostrils of this creature. And this is a very complex piece, piece of iconography or object which, in which multiple characters appear as, as it is turned and held. In this sense, it is surprising that more has not been made of the obvious links to Vivieros de Castro's Amerindian Deleuzean perspectivism. In the Caribbean context, houses in the domestic realm are key sites of interaction and, st and stabilization. This corporeal volatility takes on additional meanings, uh, layers of meaning in the violence of colonial situation, in which bodies are broken and unmade through ill treatment, separation from kin and community, and disruption to normal regimes of care. In such contexts, the provision of hammocks and cassava literally and metaphorically extended kinship, seeing to the body and its emotional and ontological care. 
Taking this further, the proximity and exposure of the indigenous body to enemy others, so colonizers, slavers, encomenderos, and indigenous strangers, may have been seen as a contagious threat, leaving one vulnerable to becoming more like the other. This is also suggested in colonial era indigenous sites in Hispaniola, Jamaica, and Cuba, where communities maintained cultural separation from the Spanish when, whenever possible. We know that white bodies were an object of comparison and experimentation for indigenous people. We can see that in incidents such as the murder of the conquistador Salcedo, um, whose body was then sort of left out to see what would happen to it. Seen in this light, um, the insistence on hammocks and cassava by indigenous and exploited people in work camps, Spanish towns, and encomienda sites may have, be, may have been a way of fending off enemy incorporation or cannibalism and an attempt to domesticate or make kin of the other. Indeed, this can be seen as a form of counterattack or desire to draw colonial others into kin making projects. This provides another perspective on the abundance of local material culture in Spanish sites. Um, especially so in contrast to indigenous sites, we get loads of indigenous ma material culture in Spanish sites. Um, um, especially related to food and drink, filling the impoverished conquerors' culture and stomachs with indigenous things. We see similar strategies used by indigenous people and Spaniards in early name exchange ceremonies called Guaiciayo, uh, in which strangers adopted each other's names, body ornaments, and clothing. In a different and modern context, Kim, Kim Torbear has contrasted settler eliminatory ontologies with indigenous strategies of calling non-indigenous people into kin relations in order to relate and to be more accountable to indigenous lifeways long constituted in intimate relation with this place. And this place that she's talking about is Minnesota in the Dakota US War of 1862. In this sense, hammocks and cassava bread made by communities of laborers for others, indigenous and non-indigenous was a strategy of care in exploitation which also drew people into intimate relation with places and lifeways, such that indigenous things became Indio and Creole things, which continue to be Caribbean things today. In this paper, we have explored the ways local materials, substances, bodies, and affects were assembled and circulated through the encomienda system, indicating the capacities of even carceral communities such as on Mona to affect the world. This helps us think about the different and relational basis of indigenous political ontologies, in the early colonial period. People came together in intimate entanglements in which objects of emotion related to eating and rest circulated between and adhered bodies. Their use established sensory and somatic worlds and a moral economy rooted in traditional habitus, but re-territorialized, in the words of Delanda, as part of new assemblages of both the free and unfree. Different but connected worlds unfold together one in which hammocks and cassava were produced under coercion to maximize the economic potential of laboring bodies, and another in which local staples eased the labor of others through the extension of nurture and nourishment from their makers to their consumers. These different reality-making projects deliberately interfered with one another at times, and we can maybe call that resistance. And as archeologists wishing to construct non-European pasts, we can follow these alternative political ontologies in the assemblages we excavate. And just sort of you know bringing all that together and sort of final thoughts then. The contrast between Conquistador Oviedo's technical sketch of a hammock and Flemish printmaker Stradamus's rape fantasy of America lounging in her hammock shows the changing attitude of Europeans toward na towards Native Americans in the 16th century. In the 50 years between the production of these two images, the hammock turns from an ethnographic curiosity to a symbol of primitive and effeminate America. The slide in the reputation of the hammock within colonial imaginaries underscores its centrality as an object and site of emotion and tension. This paper focuses on the first half of the 16th century, when for colonists, hammocks were virile objects, racially unmarked and associated with labor, status, utility and war, and readily adopted. And for indigenous people under encomienda, they offered a defense against cannibalism, rooted in the materiality, symbolism, and aesthetics of convivial activities such as eating and rest. In this context, hammocks and, hammocks and cassava were not just about preserving traditional lifeways, but also part of future-oriented projects. Hammocks and cassava are often seen by outsiders, like ourselves, in supermarkets or sold along highways in tourist areas. We do not claim continuity in, in their use in the Caribbean today, but we do recognize that archaeology withdraws from contemporary identity politics 
and compartmentalizes the indigenous legacy as something glimpsed in objects, individuals, or endangered, rather than as something which is widespread and alive in the cultural poetics of the contemporary Caribbean. As we try to work out what they mean in archaeological contexts, replacing narratives about encomienda as exploitation with one about encomienda as caring labor, another form of power, we join with scholars in the Caribbean whose work disturbs the role of archaeologist as knowing spectator and gatekeeper of indigeneity, breaking down the separation between past and present perpetuated within, within academia. And I'm particularly referring to two kind of recent um, edited volumes by Roberto Valcarcel and Jorge Ulloa um, on, on um, practice, contemporary indigenous practices and indigeneity in the Caribbean. Hammocks and cassava are emergent. Their emergence is due to a different set of relations every time, whether in the 16th century Caribbean, later 16th century Brazil, on board ships in the British Navy, or in a Leicester backyard on a summer's day. So we are not tracing a continuous line between hammock use and cassava, and cassava consumption from the past to present. This treats indigenous things as nothing more than diluted traces in the present. Rather, hammocks and cassava are multi-temporal and today are part of new assemblages, but they also carry within them or commingle with the past, appearing in moments when particular pasts are actualized and the past and present fold together, such as through archeological work. Whenever they are consumed, hammocks and cassava produce new bodies and affects. Oops. Um, sorry, I just yeah, the slide's wrong. I just one more sentence. <laughs> um, um, yeah, whenever they are consumed, hammocks and cassava produce new bodies and affects. There is no unbroken legacy. Rather, every assemblage leads to multiple new emergencies and to new assemblages. In the words of Sil Silvia Riv Riv uh, Rivera Cusicanqui, the past future is contained in the present. We cannot address their multiplicities here. That is work best left to others. And that's why I started this presentation with a couple of quotations from um, uh, Eduardo Lalo's uh, um, book um, and also on the work of uh, Sharina um, Feliciano Santos on um, revitalization uh, in Puerto Rico today. But I've kind of lost my slide, so apologies for that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that excellent, wonderful talk. Um, I know I have so many questions. But I'd also, I also am cognizant of the time that we're coming up close to 2 p.m. So I'm wondering if there are any questions that people would like to start off with um, or uh, just put it in the chat or go ahead and raise your hand uh, either physically or through the raise hand function in Zoom. Well, I, I perhaps, I, I, I have a question that, I mean, not only, I think that the, the scope of the talk is fantastic. I really love the way in which you're engaging the past with the present and your use of assemblage and thinking through assemblage. Um, you know, and I, I think what's particularly interesting about it is not just the kind of Deleuzian sense of, sense of assemblage, but also the way that archeologists have traditionally looked at assemblage, which is what is missing in this assemblage and the way that what is missing prompts particular kinds of questions. Um, thinking about the assemblage of something that both preserves and does not preserve in the archaeological record. And in some ways, in, in my work in the kind of 18th and 19th centuries, um, knowing the process of an institution such as slavery or race, exist, race exists, but not seeing it directly in the material culture prompts particular kinds of questions about what is not there. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that plays into your work with affect, with um, early colonialism and with hammocks. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I mean, um, in terms of sort of, um, yeah, what is not there, I think what is, what is not there is the kind of ability and the language to kind of find ways to interpret this material. It's not that it's not there, it is there. I think it's the way that we as archaeologists frame our questions. This is the same, we see this in every generation with a different topic. In the 90s it was gender, you know, and um, I think that that is the, the, just 
repeats itself and it's really to do with the archaeological imagination rather than the archaeological record as such. Um, and I think that, um, and this is really kind of, you know, just sort of talking about affect. And this is something that I'm just sort of beginning to think about um, really, and it's based a lot, a lot upon the work of Rachel Krellin and Oliver Harris here in Leicester, who see, especially Rachel Krellin, who sees affect as a potentially useful, um, non-anthropocentric kind of alternative to thinking about agency um, in the past. So yeah, that's sort of what I'd say in, in response to that. And I found that, that those kind of ideas actually really helpful in thinking through some of this material. Yeah, just I might add a couple of words there, Alice. I mean, um, I mean, for me, I feel like with, in terms of material, like we're incredibly privileged on Mona. Like, you know, it's rare to find the assemblages that we find on Mona that come together. And therefore, I feel a bit of a responsibility to try and think about them in interesting ways. And that's what we've been trying to do. And the thing, other thing I think is that when we found these amazing materials, like I exposed my own sort of complete lack of understanding of how on earth to start approaching this material culture and these interactions. I mean, in reality, I've got no clue where to start, right? When you start to see two worlds so colliding in a material world, like where on earth do you start? And I think the one thing that Alice and I agreed with was that we didn't, you know, we could, we didn't know. So you had to look for something else in order to come at them and then allowing, you know, putting the objects first as trying to give them an agency to speak and like look at it through that paradigm as a trying our best, but that was really what we wanted to do. And affect theory works really well for that. It helps us to sort of change the perspective with which you're trying to look at stuff. And, um, and therefore it fits really nicely for us because it sort of tries to remove us a little bit from it in a way. But, um, but it's, yeah, so I think we're lucky with the materials and then we're trying to find a different way of looking at it, but it's not easy. I, I think those are very productive answers. And, and just, um, you know, I also think it behooves um, also to think about the, the trainings that we have and how those shape what we see as archeologists. So I'm just thinking about, um, you know, in Dominica, for example, we did come across spindle whirl whirls in slave assemblages. Right. And that kind of does not argue against your point, but further, further strengthens your point that we see these indigenous crafts and industries continue up into the 18th and 19th century. I mean, the, in 17th century Barbados, the English were going over to Dominica or St. Vincent to buy hammocks, to buy all sorts of cotton craft. And I think, you know, the, the, the predominance of colonial narratives such as sugar, right, over over. Um, speaks over the other kinds of uh, enterprises that were going on in much later periods of the Caribbean. So I think that there's a point here that you, you have that's really important that can be expanded on. Well, what's interesting about that, Mark, is that, um, is that all of those commodities, both the hammocks, cotton, and the sugar, they're all disappearing, right? We don't see any of them, right? And so therefore, yeah, exactly. we're left with this sort of hardwired material culture with these very, very scant little bits Left yeah, and that's sort of the, what I was trying to get at with stuff. the what is missing, right? Yeah. The thing that we actually study is not the mm -hmm. thing we actually want to know about. Yeah, and it's that. And that's why, like, looking at it in a way is, is a really interesting way of playing with the sort of bigger questions about those materialities and also looking at the unseen indigenous influence on these yeah. European communities, which is unseen archaeologically, but is clearly profound in how they slept and what they ate and how they lived. You know, that's very, very interesting. Excellent. Sophia? Hi, um, thank you so much for such a fabulous talk. Um, I am an art historian and it's been so wonderful to hear kind of about different methodologies that are being used in archeology span that I can apply to my own kind of studies of material and visual culture. Um, and I was really drawn to kind of the slides that you had, you know, not really side by side, but one after the other of, you know, these nails, these spindle wheels, these really kind of humble objects. And then you have the semi, right, which is, you know, so this like very beautiful kind of sculptural object. Um, and I think I was just wondering what kind of role spirituality and indigenous belief systems are playing in your analysis um, and how you're how they're th you're thinking about these assemblages. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's like, I, I'm just really, I'm curious. Sorry, that's not very eloquent, but yes. <laughs> Do you want to go, Alice? Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Sophia. That was very eloquent. Um, I totally understood your question. Um, yes, um, I think that 
the so indigenous materiality, even in sort of encomienda situations like this, um, uh, still sort of uh, drew on kind of traditional practices. So I showed a couple of images of pottery there, which was kind of these models, beautiful like modeled heads, um, which, so not just, yes, you're right, the Zemi that I showed is, was probably kind of a high status object, not an everyday object, but certainly things like, you know, domestic vessels and things like that were often decorated with multiple um, adornos. Um, and, you know, we see in some sites a kind of drop off of that in the early colonial um, period. But I think that sort of your question enables us to kind of hop to another area of the island, which is the sort of subterranean realm, which is something that we've also been working on because there is a huge amount of rock art in um, caves in Mona, which do point to this spiritual or sacred religious dimension of indigenous worldview. And that doesn't stop in the colonial period. So where we have these quite kind of, you know, um, uh, um, um, exploitative, like um, constrained situations, maybe in the encomienda site, what we see is like post encomienda in the later uh, mid 16th century, still the continued use of caves for um, religious practices. And um, so we have 16th century um, on, on, on Mona, there is, there is a cave which was visited multiple times in the 16th century by Spanish and indigenous individuals who um, continued rock art practices, but then in um, a Christian kind of form on the island. Um, and in fact, the indigenous, um, well, Spanish chronicles talk about there being a church um, on the island uh, as well. So I think that um, in, we do have quite a lot of indications for um, the kind of religious encounter um, and the coming together of different sort of um, religious world views and the continuation of religious practices um, on the island as well, even in the midst of this, um, you know, exploitative kind of regime. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if yeah, you're not a historian, you should, just, you should just have a look at our Latin American antiquity paper on the, on the, graffiti, on the, the inscriptions. There's some biblical quotes and also named individuals. Yeah. So we have a factor, Francisco Alegre, who's in Puerto Rico, who, we, who signs his name on the cave wall next to some Calvary Christian crosses next to the pre-Columbian uh, iconography of religious belief within the cave system about 500 meters away from the site where we're excavating the hammock and so you get this real real connection both with individual people and their experience going to the island and also that religious belief and then also the materiality so it's a very nice little coming together of different sources of information historical uh art historical and archaeological. That's absolutely fascinating. I'll definitely look it up. And I know it's uh, two p over past 2 p.m. But just to ask like a very, very quick follow up question. I'm curious because like the way kind of way it's like these these kind of cult, these kind of different um, kind of cultures that are coexisting are being described as there's kind of this secular culture that's existing with the Spanish um, that's there's trade, there's cultural exchange and there's this kind of spiritual culture. Right where we have, you know, the maintenance of indigenous practices, even if you do kind of have the Christian aspect there. And I'm wondering, like, can you bring this kind of spirituality and these kinds of um, religious practices to bear in relationship to say a hammock, right? Or a spindle wheel or something that seems like it would just be a purely kind of secular use, um, at least from our kind of modern perspective. For me on this, just like it comes into, in my mind, this, this totally new thing, which is the concept of property ownership, right? That is mm -hmm. a new concept coming in mm -hmm. that you can mm -hmm. own an object and have possession of it. And that it's a mm -hmm. non-functioning you know, non functioning object that you own as a personal person. Yeah. That's, I think, to my mind, a totally new mm -hmm. concept. And therefore this relationship between personal ownership versus what, versus, oh, sorry, versus what I would, oh, sorry, sorry my fault, uh, versus what I would call belonging and a sense of belonging, which is not personal versus religious and, and spiritual. Mm. And there's different things. So that's a sort of problematizing it as a starting point for where you get the relationship with materiality. Yeah, yeah. And it also kind of follow up on that a bit by saying that I don't really see it as a kind of, you, you present it a little bit as a binary. I don't think the Spanish weren't secular. They were also deeply religious in different ways. Um, they weren't, yes, they weren't, it wasn't like in sort of um, Mexico and Peru where they set up seminaries and like, you know, had sort of programmatic conversions, but mm -hmm. the encomenderos and, 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 you know, all these colonists coming in came from a, you know, their own religious backgrounds and brought that to bear with them. And that's one of the sort of fantastic things we can see in the 
cave and in the rock art and also in the Encomienda site that there were new creative things emerging that maybe in later stages of colonization, once we get to the main, to the, to the mainland, had gone, become more programmatic and become more kind of, you know, these things have been practiced and, you know, quickly practices, indigenous practices were stamped out. We don't see that so much in in the sites on Mona and other sites in, in the Caribbean. There's still this, you know, kind of experimentation in a sense, both like technologically when we're talking about, you know, the tools that were imported to, to make hammocks and the thimbles and the nails and things like that, but also um, spiritually and religiously in the conversations that people were having about their respective kind of beliefs and understandings. And I do believe that, you know, um, there were many indigenous converts who were genuine and like authentic converts to Christianity who held, um, you know, sort of you know, complex religious sort of um, beliefs in this period, as, as well as those individuals who maybe resisted um, Christianity as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, that answer. It, 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 it is uh, about that time, but I, I'm sure Alice and Jago wouldn't mind answering a few more questions. But just before everyone gets uh, leaves the room, I would like to point out that this is not the last we're going to be hearing of this part of the Caribbean. Reniel Rodriguez has agreed to be giving a talk in May, and um, I saw Paula. Paula, I'm going to be asking you shortly <laughs> to also be giving a talk, as well as a few other people. So thank you all for coming, and let's uh, all applaud Jago and Alice, and Alice and Jago, and um, everyone for giving this wonderful talk. Thank you. Thanks. And just for me, just um, I miss you, Reniel and Roberto and Paolo. It's lovely to see your faces there. And thanks a lot for attending. And uh, I miss you lots. Yeah. Cheers. Hey, Roberto. Ciao, ciao. Roberto.